the questions. I'd encourage you all to pepper him with as many questions as possible. The, the more questions, the better. So before he gets here, I just want to make sure you get that out of the way. Mike loves questions. Please get them to him. Uh, I am, I'm Matt Parkinson. I'm the, the Director of Data Analysis at uh, Department of Local Government Finance. I would venture to guess that at one point or another I've interacted with probably most people in the room. Uh, I've, I've been in, at the agency for uh, 15 months or so, so I think this is my third auditor's conference and, and my second one that I'm speaking at. Uh, it's a real joy to be here. Uh, I think my favorite part uh, of the job of, of working at, at DLGF more broadly is uh, the interactions that we have with, with folks out in the counties, and at the county level in particular. So um, we're always grateful for, for your cooperation. Uh, we try our best to be very, very customer service oriented, um, and we love feedback, or, or I do at least. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate for you all today a few things that we have in development on Gateway that we're going to be rolling out over the upcoming months. Uh, we're going to talk about software compliance a little bit too, which, which was my topic from from the Fall Auditors Conference, uh, and, and we'll touch on, on gateway training as well. Uh, so, so we'll hop into it, but, but again, um, at any point uh, now or, or, or afterward, I welcome um, any feedback or questions that, that anyone has. So I'll spend just the first uh, five or 10 minutes or so going through, uh, through some software compliance matters. Uh, 50 IAC 26 is the administrative code that, that governs a good portion of, of DLGF's operations, and in particular, uh, the data analysis division's operations. And one of the key components of 50 IAC 26 uh, is section 18, which governs uh, software compliance. So on a five-year cycle, DLGF is tasked with certifying uh, the property tax management systems used at the county levels, both in the assessor offices and in the auditor's offices. Uh, to verify that they operate in a uniform manner and that they're in line with, with some of the other standards established in 50 ISC 26. Uh, so right now we're on the tail end of, of the current five-year cycle. The previous administrative code was 50 ISC 23, uh, so that was sort of the first round of software compliance. We're on the second round of it uh, right now. Software compliance is broken into uh, three distinct phases. So uh, phase one was a phase that focused exclusively on, on uh, the vendors themselves. So we tested their, their standalone functionality. So it was the ability to, to do some of the basic things that you would expect a sales disclosure system to do, uh, or, or uh, a camera system to do, or, or a tax and billing system to do. That occurred mostly in 2014 and, and wrapped up um, somewhere in the ballpark of, of July and August 2014. It started actually in 2013. Uh, so phase one, it was detailed. I think that your, your tax and bill vendors would uh, attest to that, that um, it was comprehensive and it was difficult, but um, uh, it went well. We ended up getting through it well with, with all our vendors. Phase two tested integrative functionality uh, between vendors. So, so we would test to see that, uh, for instance, uh, sales disclosure form data, data from sales disclosure system uh, could move its way successfully into, into a CAMA system, or that CAMA data could move its way into the tax and billing system. And phase two was actually uh, new this year relative to uh, 50 IAC 23, our first round of software compliance testing. So the thought behind incorporating phase two was that we could test the interactions among the software vendors at one time uh, here locally, and then uh, reduce the workload when we go out into the county offices. So if you were around five years ago, uh, you probably recall that, that the infield testing was a little bit more in depth than it has been this year. Um, and that's, that's thanks to, um, to the inclusion of phase two. Uh, so after phase two, which, which wrapped up um, somewhere in, in the winter months, starting in February, we began uh, phase three. And I, I think that many of you have, have gone through phase three at this point. Um, it's, it's relatively light testing, I think. Just we, we walk through a few scenarios. We verify that the system in place um, is the same one that we tested in phase one and that the pairings are the same pairings that we tested uh, in phase two. So here are uh, a few of our statistics on software compliance testing. Uh, as of May 11th, so I, I submitted the deck to Debbie uh, almost two weeks ago. As of May 11th, we, we had been to 83 assessor offices and 84 auditor's offices. At, at this point, 
we're actually up to, we've been to 88 assessor's offices, 89 auditor's offices, and uh, we've had just one colleague making all the visits, James Johnson. Actually, I'm just curious, show of hands, how, how many of you in here have interacted with James over the last few months? Yeah, I see almost every hand in the room going up. Uh, he's very professional. He's one, of, he's one of the best employees that we have. Um, he's thorough and, and knowledgeable and, and very good at his job. Um, so we were excited about sending him out into the field. And it's been kind of, kind of fun for him, too. We, we think that he's one of the rare state employees that has reason to go to, to all 92 counties, maybe one of the rare uh, citizens of the state that has reason to go to all 92 counties. Um, so that's been, that's been fun for him. Uh, as of May 11th, we, we had received requests for certification from 79 counties, issued phase three certification to 78. Uh, we're actually up a little bit higher than that now. We're in, we're in the 80s on, on both of those counts. So we're almost to the end of this five-year cycle for software compliance testing. By the time we get to the end of June, what we anticipate is that we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be through, through 91 of 92 counties. Um, so, so really proud of those stats, proud of the work that James has done. Uh, tremendously grateful for, for all of the work that you all have put in to, to achieving um, software certification. Uh, and of course, to, to the property tax management system vendors for all the work they've done. There is a future to software compliance testing. I know as much as, as folks would like for this to be the end of it, it's, it's not. It's, uh, so software compliance testing is on uh, a five-year cycle. So our next wave of testing is scheduled at this point for uh, 2018, 2019, uh, and 2020. And basically, as far as we can tell, we're going to be uh, repeating a similar process five years from now uh, as what we're going through right at the moment. So uh, we have a really active relationship, of course, with the counties. We also have a really active relationship uh, with the vendors, and, and, and our hope is to uh, maintain that active relationship over the next few years so that when the next wave of, uh, of the five-year software compliance testing rolls around, uh, it's, it's not overly uh, difficult, it's not overly burdensome. Um, hopefully it runs relatively smoothly in, in the same way that, that it has this year. Uh, speaking of the vendors, the, the vendors are, uh, are asked to uh, submit documentation to DLGF for, for system updates. If there are major changes in system functionality, uh, it, it is possible that additional certification testing would be triggered. Um, so, so basically when documentation is submitted to us, we'll, we'll sort of do an analysis on it to, to identify whether it's a minor update or, or whether it's a major update uh, to see if it's the kind of thing that should uh, bring about additional waves of testing. And actually, while, while we're on this, on this particular slide, uh, we do have really good relationships with the, with the vendors, as I know you all do as well. We actually brought in the, the property tax vendors, both from the assessment side and from the auditor side for, uh, for a summit of sorts uh, back in January where we received a lot of feedback from the vendors and, and we, we debuted some of the plans we had and we actually kind of gave them a sneak peek even then at a couple of the applications that, that I'm going to show to you all today. Um, just on a, on a personal level, I, I think our vendor community is great. They, they do a really nice job of uh, helping get information out to the counties. They were very thorough uh, in their testing, making sure that they reached certification status. Um, so for any of them that are in the room, uh, I try to say it every chance I get, we appreciate all the work that you all put in, all the help that you do to make uh, these systems operate as smoothly as possible and in line with the standards laid out in 50 IAC 26. I do want to point out one thing, and again, if, if Mike was in the room, he would love me for doing this. Uh, it, it's worth noting that uh, DLGF is actually party to the contracts between, between counties um, and their property tax vendors, so it's, it's a three-party contract, and there's, there's some standard language that goes into it. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to improve upon is, is the collection of those contracts to make sure that we, uh, we're always uh, up to date on, on which counties are using which vendors, so, so in particular, uh, if, if you're a county that's uh, planning to, to move from one vendor to another, or if you just have questions about contracts in general, um, our, our department's legal staff contact information is here. Uh, Mike is our general counsel. Dave works very closely with him. You're also more than welcome to, fil to filter those questions through me, um, and I'm happy to do what I can to assist. Uh, but this is, this is one area that we're, um, we're hoping to patch up a little bit moving forward.
So with that said, that's, that's sort of the update on, on software certification. Again, we are almost to the end of the cycle, hard to believe. I'm going to spend the bulk of the, the remainder of my time this morning uh, speaking to you about Gateway. Uh, so if, if you're a longtime auditor or you've been around, I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're very familiar with Gateway. Uh, if you're newer to, um, to an elected position or you're newer to a staff position, you may have a little bit less familiarity with it, and that, that's great too. So I'll give just kind of a, a brief overview. I'll keep it really light on, on some of Gateway's functionality. And then I'm going to hop into a project that, that we're calling DCAF uh, to, to de debut some things, to demonstrate some things we have coming out in the next few months. Uh, so this is, what, this is what the Gateway portal looks like. Uh, I, I think that there's a good chance everyone in this room has been to it, or, or most folks at least have been to it. Uh, Gateway's been around since, since roughly 2011. Uh, it's, it's a joint project among DLGF and State Board of Accounts, uh, with a partnership with Indiana University. And then we have a couple other agencies that are also online now for, for education matters, uh, for, for gaming. Uh, so it's, it's a site that we take a lot of pride in. Um, we, we have a team uh, of developers and, and, and a team of support staff that, that spend almost all of their time uh, working on Gateway, trying to keep it up and running smoothly, working on improvements from, from questions and feedback that we receive. Uh, so it, it's, it's a site that we're really proud of. Uh, the URL is, is posted on screen. I, I, again, I imagine that most, most folks have been there. Uh, if you'd like to, to take down the URL for, to another location, you can reach Gateway through, through the DLGS website. We have, we have an icon right on our main page. Uh, so, so Gateway serves two primary purposes. It's, it's a public transparency site. Uh, so, so we have uh, public reports and, and the ability to download data for those who are interested in looking at um, some of the publicly available data for their local governments. And, and then, of course, it serves as a data collection site. Data collection is the piece that, that our local officials work with the most often. So, so when I say data collection, that's entering data into, into the budget forms, into debt management, uh, into TIF management. A lot of things that historically were either uh, offline or, or too difficult to collect altogether are now done through, uh, through this one central location. So I'm actually going to hop on the gateway and, and just show a few things, um, particularly for those in the room who may be a little bit newer to it. Uh, so again, if, if you would like to get the gateway through, through the DLGF site, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's a, a place that you've never been before, if, if you log on to DLGF's homepage, uh, right here we have a, a, an icon for, for gateway. And the piece that I actually want to show you the most today, I don't know how often our local officials do or don't get into it. It's, it's the report builder section. So, so I mentioned that gateway serves two purposes. We've got data collection and we've got transparency. And it's in particular, transparency as it relates to local government financial data. The report builder section, uh, it, it turns a lot of the data submitted uh, by the local officials around and makes it publicly available for, for taxpayers or, or for organizations that may be interested in knowing uh, data about you know, annual financial reports or about budgets or, or debts for their, uh, for their local counties. So as we scroll down here on the, on the report builder section, uh, you can see a lot of the icons are the same as those that you interact with when you've logged in on the local official side. And we've got uh, reports that relate to most things that folks are going to enter in. Uh, on, on the budget side, the budget's, you know, of course, one of the things I'm most familiar with. You can see that most of the forms that, that are entered into uh, the application, the, the data from those forms ends up um, being turned around so that the public can view it. So uh, we could look at, for instance, uh, line item data from, from uh, say, 2015 budgets. It's easy to filter down by the particular unit that you're interested in. So uh, Adams County, I'm going to pick on you. You can look at county data. Adams County, we're going to filter it by fund. So we'll just take a look at general fund data, view report. I'm just curious, how many folks have been to the, to the report builder, to the public site? OK, so a good number of hands. That's good to see. Uh, so again, just if, if there was a, a taxpayer in your county or, or, 
or even outside of Indiana that was interested in this data, this is a good way to see uh, the exact same information that's entered into the budget forms. Um, so we have, we have similar sections for, for the AFR that I know State Board of Accounts works with. Uh, for debt, it's a really commonly used one. Um, and one of the cool ones that we have up is uh, property tax. We, we have property tax summaries. Uh, Jeff Kuster is, is our assistant director of data analysis. Um, extraordinarily bright guy. He, he's got a great mind for numbers, uh, for programming, for, for database technology. So he's, he's put a lot of work into putting together these property tax summaries over the last couple years. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, it's something that's pretty cool to check out. Uh, so we can, we can look at the county level property tax summaries. Uh, we'll look at it for 2014 any given county. Uh, I'm an IU guy, so we'll look at Monroe County. Anyhow, I'm just hoping to debut or to demonstrate some of the things that you can see through the report builder section if you've never had a chance to check it out. So it kind of gives a breakdown on, on who pays property taxes and where your taxes are going to go. It's got some circuit breaker data. Uh, it's you know different different ways that that budgets are are, are allocated. Um, it we only have so many ways that that we can easily tie together assessment side data with with budget side data, and this is one of our ways that we do it. So uh, again, if you've never been to the report builder section, if you've never been to to the property tax summaries, I'd encourage you to check it out because there are folks in your counties who who view it. We receive a lot of questions uh, or media requests or, or public records requests related to data that's seen here. And then finally, uh, because we're here, I, I want to take one more opportunity to show off a site um, that I'm not sure how many folks in the room would have been to before. Uh, so, so we have a site that, that DLGF and, and IBRC, the, the Indiana University Group, has, has worked to put together. Um, it's known as budgetnotices.in.gov. Um, if that URL is familiar to you, it's because it's, it's on your Form 3s in the budget application. So starting this year, for most units, the only type of, of public notice is um, the Form 3 submitted through Gateway and then published onto this particular website. So right now we're on uh, budgetnotices.in.gov. It, it's a really, really nifty site if, if you've never been here before. Uh, what we have is, is an API that we, we run through, through Google. So you can, you can either click on a map or you can type in an address. And when you do, it's going to, uh, to pull back uh, the taxing units that are applicable to, to where you live or the address you're typing in. So 100 North Senate Avenue, Indianapolis, Indiana. This is the address for, for the government center. As you can see on the map, it, it shows the government center. And if we scroll down, it's going to take just a moment to load, but it's, it's going to pull up uh, hopefully the taxing district and the taxing units. You know, So right now it's set up for, uh, for 2015 budgets. We're in the process of, of initializing this for 2016. Uh, but basically what you can do is you can, you can look at the data that was submitted through the Form 3. It's repopulated here on this website for taxpayers to go find. Um, so we're going to have data about your, your levy from the prior year, proposed budget, proposed levy. Uh, so we're looking at Marion County because I typed in a Marion County address. Uh, if you click on the URL under the budget notice, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pull up a PDF. And it's basically just going to be a, a regeneration of, of the Form 3 that's submitted through, through Gateway. So um, again, this is a site that, that taxpayers in your counties are going to. Um, it is now the official way to find uh, your budget notice. Uh, and it's one that, that a number of folks on, on our team and at IU have put uh, a lot of work into. So uh, highly encourage you to uh, to go check it out, take a look at, at the units in your county or the units in other counties. Um, and if you have feedback for us, that's wonderful. We're always ready for that. One new feature that we're rolling out for, for 2016 budgets is the ability to, uh, to type in your email address and to subscribe to receive budget notifications. So um, say that you are a taxpayer in Marion County, like I am. Um, if I was interested in knowing uh, when all of the budget notices were submitted from Marion County or, or you know, I, I grew up on the east side, so perhaps I'm interested in Warren Township and Warren Township Schools and Marion County. Uh, you can identify the particular budget notices that you want to subscribe to. And when that bu bu budget notice is submitted through Gateway, uh, right away that taxpayer is going to receive a notification saying you can log on and see your budget notice. So uh, we think that it makes it available to folks uh, in a timely manner. 
uh, something that hopefully things people find really useful uh, for, for transparency purposes. Anyhow, because I had you all here, had to make a plug for our site, please check out budgetnotices.in.gov. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the next uh, 20, 25 minutes talking about uh, a few new features that we're rolling out in 2015 uh, for, for Gateway. So Gateway, is, especially for those of you who have been around for a while, as you know, Gateway is, is an evolving tool. Um, we're always looking to add more functionality to it to, it, uh, to make it more user friendly. And, and I know that one of, the, one of the items that's just been um, a, a long time burden for folks has, especially at the county level, of course, is uh, CNAV entry. So, so this year for 2016 budgets, we do have a new CNAV tool that we're rolling out. Uh, we're really excited about it. It's actually going to be a, a two-part application, and I'm going to show you both sides of it today. So we're going to have a portion of the application that's for, for CNAV, and we're going to have a portion of the application that's for Form 22 entry. Form 22s, of course, haven't been on Gateway up until now, so we're excited to get this one online. I think there are going to be a lot of benefits to it in terms of um, the ability to, to more timely have that data, to make sure that we have it more accurately. So I'm really excited to show you that part. Uh, we're calling the project, as I mentioned a little bit ago, uh, DCAF, which stands for, for Data Entry for CNAV and Form 22. Uh, I don't know if that name's going to stick. I happen to like it myself. But uh, one way or another, when you actually see it on the main gateway page, it's not there yet. It, it'll either be called DCAF or it'll perhaps be called um, some similar name. So CNAV submission, just an overview. I, I have to think that everyone in the room is, is well familiar with, with how CNAVs work. Uh, net assessed values are, are certified by county auditors, so by you all, um, each summer. The statutory deadline is, is August 1st. Um, we know that deadline is not always hit for, for any number of reasons, but that, that's the deadline at least um, in the code. So. Uh, in, in budget years from, I think it was 2011, up through this past year, we had county auditors enter CNAV data through the Gateway application uh, on a section that was, that was titled County-Specific Functions. So uh, once you log into to the local officials login and get into the budget forms, you had sort of your forms on the left, and then on the right side you had County-Specific Functions. That's where CNAV was before. Uh, we're going to be moving it this year. So beginning with the 2016 budget cycle, it's going to be in its own application, currently called DCAF, and, and something that I hope is really popular with folks in the room, we do have an upload option available. So I, I know how tedious it is to, to key in all that data for all the taxing districts across all those columns. You still do have the option to do that if, if you're so inclined, uh, but, but we do have the ability to upload it. Uh, the tax and bill vendors during software certification phase one uh, demonstrated the ability to generate uh, CNAV extracts. So, so there are two different CNAV extracts. There's, there's a CNAV 1 and a CNAV 2. So the exact file formats they were able to demonstrate during phase 1 so software certification are the ones that we're going to be using with, with the DCAF application. Over the next few weeks, in case there are any, any vendors in the room, we'll be reaching out once we have the application in, in a state that we think is finalized to coordinate with you all just for, for a little bit of last minute testing. But um, given that you were able to demonstrate it during, during phase one, we don't expect to see many major hiccups there. Uh, and, and again, we, we think that the ability to upload data is going to be a real time saver for folks. Uh, so I'm really excited about that one. And, and I know from a lot of the gateway support calls we had last year, I think at least county folks can be excited about that ability as well. Uh, so for CNAF submissions, uh, we are going to be uh, it's going to largely look the same as it did last year in terms of the overall look and feel. Um, assessed values are going to be collected uh, before withholding and then with a withholding column and then after withholding. So, so that's going to be um, explicit. And then one thing that's new, if, if you happen to be a county that has conservancies in it, conservancy assessed values are going to be uh, submitted through Gateway this year. His historically, as far as I know at least, I think they've been emailed into the budget division, perhaps either to your field rep or... or Courtney when she was the budget director, or, or Susan now. Uh, we're going to have the ability to submit conservancy assessed values um, just on one extra page on top of the CNAV application. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a four-step process. Uh, it's historically been a three-step process. So we have first data entry, 
and then we have uh, tying out taxing districts to funds, uh, and then we have a, a place to check uh, whether those ties all went correctly, and I'm going to show this to you here in a few minutes. And then the fourth step is the new one. That's where we're going to have uh, conservancy assessed values entered. Uh, these are the four steps, They're the same ones that I just went over. Again, we'll demonstrate this here in just a moment. Uh, this is what, what step one looks like. Um, it, it's got a, a slightly different uh, feel to it. We're using um, a technology called uh, Telerik, which is um, you know, just, just a different look and feel for, uh, for the application. Uh, but it's going to be similar in functionality to, to what it's historically been. Uh, step two is going to, to give you the ability to tie out taxing districts to individual funds. So funds are going to be at the unit level, of course. Um, and again, I'll show this to you. I do want to point out values are going to roll forward uh, from 2015 certified data. So uh, for as much as things are similar from 2015 going into the 2016 budget cycle, um, those relationships are already going to be there for you. Um, once you click on a unit name on this prior page on the right side, it's going to pull up uh, just a, a section like this that allows you to identify um, which funds should be associated with the taxing district that you also have selected. Uh, in a lot of cases, of course, all the funds for a taxing unit are going to be associated with the taxing district, but if, if you have just one or two funds that apply, um, it's going to be a pretty easy unit user interface, similar to some of the things we have in the budget applications right now, just a, a checkbox method. This is step three. It, it basically takes it in the other direction. We have color coding set up on both steps two uh, and steps three that, that allow you to easily identify visually um, if, a, if a piece might have been missed. So if there's a fund that's not currently tied to a taxing district, uh, you have the ability here to identify that and then go back to step two and make those updates. And then finally, uh, step four is going to be conservancy AVs. I'm actually not going to be able to demonstrate conservancy AVs today, but um, the user interface, it, it would be tough to make it much simpler. It's going to have effectively just three fields. So, so you'll have like a conservancy ID or I think conservancy name and AV, and, and that's it. So uh, very straightforward data entry. But one thing about conservancy AVs is we don't have conservancies in the extracts that the tax and bill vendors are able to generate. So it's the one piece that is going to require uh, manual data entry. Um, again, it's, it's going to be uh, quite straightforward for folks, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't give the wrong impression that the entire process could be done through upload. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate now the CNAF portion of DCAF. Uh, software development is, is an interesting process. Um, it, it's a little bit like, uh, I, I don't know, building a house perhaps. So I don't know if anyone here has ever built a house. I, I remember when I was a kid, and my parents were building a house that we moved into, and, and we'd go and we'd look at it, you know, a couple times a week, and we'd see the progress that was being made on it. And as a kid, I had all kinds of questions, and, and people they showed had questions about, oh, okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, how's it ultimately going to appear? And, and so I hope that what I'm showing to you today is almost the model for what it's going to be like, but, but it is still an in-development um, application, which means it, it may be subject still to, to a few changes. But again, I welcome any questions or feedback anyone has on the application um, as it works right now. So I'm going to log into to sort of a different um, piece of gateway that uh, most folks don't actually have access to, but, but we do for development purposes. It's just a test site that we have. It's going to look very similar. So um, this is going to be familiar to you all, but just have a few different features on there not available to, to all users. I'm relieved to get in there. What, what I pictured myself doing when I was thinking about this presentation is forgetting my gateway password <laughs> and then effectively being locked out of showing you what I intended to show you during the presentation today. <laughs> uh, so, so of course, this is going to be familiar to any of you who have been in gateway. We do have a few things here that aren't available to the general uh, user base quite yet. And one of those is uh, the DCAF application. So again, DCAF is data entry for CNAV and Form 22. Uh, I will point out that the test site we're working on uh, operates a little bit more slowly than, than the main gateway site does. Uh, it's just it's, it's on a different server, different physical resources. Uh, 
So we're going to work with Blackford County. Uh, all the data that we're working with is in a test database, so I'm going to demonstrate some things to you, but it doesn't actually change anything in terms of live data. Uh, so this is what uh, the decaf application looks like once you're on the inside. Uh, the top portion is, is for Form 22s. The bottom portion is for CNAV, and I'll, I'll show you Form 22s here in just a few minutes. But I'm going to hop into CNAV for right now. And once you're there, it's going to have a somewhat similar feel to what it had uh, during the budget cycle. So uh, for Blackford County, we've rolled forward all the taxing districts. Uh, from the 2015 budget. You have the ability, if you're interested, to, to manually enter values here. So it's as simple as just clicking the edit icon for any given taxing district and I'm just going to type in nonsensical value. So $1,500 in, in bank personal property AV, update it, bingo, it's there. Uh, if we wanted to delete the taxing district, I'm not going to do that. If we wanted to delete it, we could do that. So again, very similar feel to what it had uh, in the budget application. But I think the piece that folks are going to find really useful is upload functionality. So, so right now, we've got no values entered. We've got nothing in our summary totals down at the bottom. Uh, I'm going to go to, um, to our upload icon. Uh, we have two different files that can be processed. There's CNAV1 and CNAV2. CNAV1 is populating step one. CNAV2 is populating the relationships between taxing districts and funds. Uh, these files um, can be extracted from tax and billing systems. Uh, so I've already, we've already done that. We have um, files we've ext extracted just for Blackford County that I put on the desktop earlier this morning. Uh, so I'm going to select the, the Blackford CNAV1 file. It's here on the web page. We can see that file has been selected. All we do is press the upload button. It tells us that our file has been successfully uploaded. So uh, we have breadcrumbs here at the top of the page, just like what you would see on, on the budget application or, or TIF management. So when we go back to step one now, we're going to see that the values are already populated. So again, all, all that, that time that went into typing in those values manually, I, I'm hoping this proves to be a big time saver for folks. Also a little bit of comfort that um, you're not going to make a keying error, uh, which is really easy to do, of course. Summary total is well populated. I know some of, some of these values are a little bit nonsensical. We, we've just put together the file for testing purposes. So these aren't the actual values that would be there. But uh, for testing purposes, I think it's easy to see how it would work. Uh, so step two, so again, similar to what step two was in the past. Uh, basically, what you'll do is you'll click on a taxing district. It'll show you at the taxing unit level. We have it set up on a color coding basis. so. Um, if it's green, that means that all of the funds for that particular taxing unit are associated with that taxing district. If it's yellow, that means that some funds are associated. Again, not really realistic, most likely just to have a few of the county funds, but it's for demonstration purposes. Uh, and so once you click on uh, a taxing unit, it pulls up the list of funds, and you can associate the funds. Um, I will point out, th these again are rolled forward from, from 2015. You're not expected to know all the funds or, or if the units in your counties are going to have new funds for the year. You're supposed to work with the information that you have. So we're not asking you to take on more responsibility than you've had in the past. Uh, but again, one of the really nice features is you can upload the CNAV2 file. So if those relationships hadn't been there or, or if you had reason to think they weren't correct, you can upload uh, the CNAV2. And once you do that, it's going to, to modify the relationships. Uh, in this case, I think it's going to leave them the same because it was already set up. It tells us that our file has been uploaded successfully. So now I'll go back to step two. Again, we'll click on a taxing district. And all those relationships are there. So if we wanted to add one, and again, I'm just going to do one that may be nonsensical. But we've got Hartford City. OK, so Hartford City has no, no funds from the county associated right now. Uh, we could check all the funds from the county. Press the Save icon. Now Blackford County shows up in green. So we hope that it provides a lot of visual cues that makes it really easy to check. Um, we, we think it's a straightforward user interface. Um, but of course, as we, we roll this out for the first time this year, we're going to be ready to provide as much customer support as needed for a new tool. Step three gives you the ability to, to review moving the other direction. So right now, we're starting with taxing units. You can identify for a taxing unit if there are funds that haven't been affiliated with any taxing district. So, so again, it's not going to catch everything, but it is going to catch some things for you. 
So right now for, for Blackford County, we, we've made up this, this bond for fund. It's not currently associated with any taxing district. So what you would do in this case is hop back into step two, um, set up the relationships. So that particular fund is associated with the correct taxing district. When we hop back here into step three then, we'd see that um, that red line has gone away. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep on moving through that, but that's, at a broad level, that's what the CNAV application looks like. So again, familiar, just sort of in a new box. Step four is the one piece that's new, and I don't have a conservancy to show you again here today. Uh, but again, it's, it's going to be straightforward. You'll have uh, your conservancy's unit code. You'll have the conservancy unit name. You'll type in the assessed value. That's it. Really straightforward to use. The submission page is going to look uh, a lot like a few of the budget forms do, or like debt management does. So you'll have your name, your title, and your PIN. Uh, if you don't know your PIN, particularly if you're, if you're a new official and haven't had to use a PIN yet, uh, we're happy to set you up with that. We have a gateway support box. It's, it's gateway at dlgf.in.gov. Um, we, we try to be really active in monitoring that, that inbox and providing answers to folks. I actually should take a moment to point out too, um, outside of the room, we do have a, a table set up. Uh, Charles Gordon is out there today. Um, Charles, probably a familiar name to many of you. He's been involved in data compliance for, for years. He's also providing some gateway support for us. So he's gonna be here uh, for the better part of the day. I'm also gonna be out at that table uh, throughout the morning. So if you have questions about DCAF, uh, about the budget application, about gateway more broadly, or just about DLGF, uh, we're more than happy to take those questions out there. So now with my last few minutes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about the Form 22 side. Uh, Form 22 and Gateway, again, is, is a brand new deal. Um, we're excited about it. We think that it's going to be a, a good way to make sure that we get data accurately and in a timely manner. We've tried our best to set it up in a user-friendly format. Um, it's not as, CNAV is just about there, ready to roll out. Form 22 is almost there as well. We're putting the finishing touches on it right now. At the moment, Form 22s are submitted uh, through email or, or occasionally mailed in, sometimes to your field reps, sometimes to Roy Scruggs in our data division. That goes to any number of places. Um, and then, then we end up entering those, those values in ourselves into, into our database. Um, so Form 22 data, as you all know, is used by the budget field representatives um, during budget reviews. Uh, we enter that data manually into, into Logadaba, which is it's a, it's a long-time database. It stands for Local Government Database. Long-time database, it's actually even older than I am. Uh, so it, it's, as you can imagine, a very time-consuming process to enter in all those distributions for all the units in all the counties. Um, and, and just like with CNAVs, where typing in values can, can be subject to error, we find the same to be true on the Form 22 side. So we're excited about having this, this new system in place that we think is gonna clean a little bit of that up. Uh, tax and bill vendors, uh, just like with CNAVs, did demonstrate the ability to, to generate um, Form 22 extracts for uploads. Uh, we talked to them about it at the vendor conference and, and we still have some ongoing communication. There are gonna be a few updates to the, to the file formats, which is the reason that we're not quite ready to roll this one out, uh, like we will be with CNAV. The updates are minor. It, it, it basically normalizes the data, which is it's just kind of a database practice um, so that we don't have everything spread across one row, but it, it's more vertical. It's, um, it, it's, more useful long-term, it provides more flexibility for, for longer-term changes to the application and to the data. We're targeting rolling this out for December distributions. I've been afraid to put this slide up because again, with, with software development, whenever you promise someone you're gonna get something out at a certain time, inevitably it's later. So, so if I'm back here in the fall, uh, or, or perhaps even next spring, and we're talking about Form 22s, please don't throw tomatoes at me or anything if, if we don't have it up. We're doing the best that we can, and, and I have confidence it's gonna be there, and I think you'll see when we demonstrate it today that it's, it's pretty close. Um, we are hoping that we can work with some of the June distributions just to do some checking on the data that's otherwise being submitted. I, I think actually some of the, the June distribution data is already being submitted, so we're hoping to use the extracts once we have those ready to go to compare it to the data that's already been submitted for this year. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna hop in and do a demonstration. The exact same caveats apply, perhaps even more so than we're on the CNAV side. It's in development. Over the last couple of days, as we've been testing things out, I do occasionally come to, to an error page or, or one thing or another doesn't work exactly like we expected. That's normal during software development. 
I think we have it down pat, so that's not going to happen today, but uh, if it does, I apologize in advance. Uh, so again, we're going to go um, back to, to our decaf page. Um, right now, it's just on Gateway Test, which is it's just a development site. Uh, it will be rolled out to the main Gateway page um, at some point in the near future. So if we go back to, to our Manage County link here up on the top portion, again, we have this front page, which is set up for, uh, for units and, and distributions, which is the Form 22 side, uh, and for the CNAV side. Uh, so I'm going to go into to units and distributions. Um, yesterday, as I was working through it, I, I actually populated some of the data in advance. So, so some of this data is already here. I'll actually, do you have to remember what the cleanup site is? Okay. Uh, one of my colleagues is Scott. Scott's been doing a lot of really good work on developing this site. He actually did really good work on developing budget notices, too. I should have given credit where it was due. So I'm going to clear out some of this data. Do you remember what that site is? So uh, as, he's, as he's working on clearing that data out for us, um, with this tool, we're going to have the ability to type in values manually uh, or to use an upload similar to, to what we did uh, before. One of the nice features of it is it also collects both advances um, and final distributions. So we think that's going to be cleared out now. Did I break it, Scott? Oh, I've managed to use it. Okay. So I, yesterday I marked a bunch of these ready to submit. I'm just going to unmark those real quick. So showing this to you in reverse, what we're doing on this page is you'll enter in uh, June distributions and December distributions, and then we'll give you the ability to mark that those are ready to submit, very similar to the budget forms. And so I'm kind of reversing that decision right now. Uh, once you've marked them ready to submit, it's going to have that same submission page that we saw on the CNAV side, where you'll enter in your name and your title. Once you do the final submission, that's when the data actually gets to DLGF. Uh, before that, you still have the ability to, to edit it and to make changes. Okay, so now I've updated our status. So going back to the Managed County page, uh, we have the ability for, to, to do manual data entry, and to do an upload. So right now I'm going to work on uh, just Harrison Township in Blackford County. Uh, if we want to, we can manage funds. So say Harrison Township was going to have a new fund that's not currently listed here. It's a matter of just selecting one from the drop-down list, pressing, pressing the Add button, and then you'll be able to indicate their distributions going to that fund. Uh, you can modify funds that you've added here. Uh, it, it's a really useful tool that way. Uh, you also have the ability to, to indicate that there are TIF districts, and these are going to apply um, across, across the county. So if, if you have a new TIF district that you'd like to enter in, it's just a matter of typing in the TIF name and the TIF code, and you can set up distributions to that TIF district as well. So I'm now back on the Manage Units page, and I'm going to Manage Distributions. So we'll show what the manual data entry looks like first. Uh, I'm going to pretend that we're working in the June settlement period. Uh, so again, we're, we're working with Harrison Township right now. The warrant number is optional. That's, that's basically your check number or your way of, of indicating to us which distribution it is. You can indicate whether it's going to be an advance or a final amount. Uh, we have an entity type, and so this is to indicate whether we're, we're documenting distribution to a fund or to a TIF district. Uh, entity code, so let, let's just say that we're going to do a distribution to the general fund. By default for June, it's going to set it to June 30th. If your actual distribution date is different, you're welcome to change it there. Let's say that we're going to have $1,000 distribution. It's as simple as that. Click on Add Distribution. It's going to display on the bottom. Um, we also have functionality so that if you add an advance in, it's going to display those advances when you go to add in your final distributions to make sure that you're entering in an amount that's net of any advances. Um, and so you can do this manually, uh, unit by unit, distribution type by distribution type. Uh, there normally be a distribution code here as well. Um, for this one, I just did financial institutions tax. Right. Okay. So we did financial institutions tax that time. Uh, you also have the ability to to edit if you actually accidentally meant to enter in ten thousand instead of ten dollars or thousand dollars. You can do it here. Make
take that update, just like that. Uh, and then finally, you have the ability to delete distributions. And I'm going to do that because I want to demonstrate the upload functionality for Form 22s. But if you want to enter it in manually, that's the way to do it. Nothing at all wrong with doing it that way. We do, however, have uh, upload functionality for uh, Form 22s. And again, given the volume of data here, I think this is the option that a lot of folks are going to choose. Um, it also, again, gives you some sort of security that the, the data that you're entering in is accurate because it's not subject then to keying errors. So uh, just like before, you can, you can extract these from tax and bill systems. So I've done that already. We have, uh, we have our file here that I'm going to upload. So we got county five, form 22. Uh, we're gonna click on the process button, perform that upload. On the test site, this portion takes a minute. I told myself I was gonna come up with jokes to tell for, for while we were uploading this. I'm not a funny guy, so it's not as easy for me to do as it would be for some others. <laughs> But if I could tell jokes, this is the point where I'd be doing it. So uh, we're going we're gonna to hang tight for a minute while this upload processes. And then when it does, uh, what we'll be able to see when we go back to, to looking at that unit page is that the distribution data has been uploaded for all the funds um, that we have populated on the page. So distribution was successful. I'm going to go back to manage units and distributions. Ah, thank you. Go back to the upload page. Glad I brought Scott with me. He's correcting me every time I do something wrong, as he should be. What's that? Page loading. Ah. Again, if I was a funny guy, I'd be happy to tell jokes right now. Just not me. Okay. So this is the data that was, uh, it's kind of in a temporary holding place um, from the file. You can take a look at it to review it. We have a red icon that will let you know if there's some sort of issue with any individual row. That data is not actually going to be submitted. So, so say that there was an invalid, I don't know, distribution code or, or some sort of invalid character, it would flag it there. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, we have an insert valid data option. This time it's going to actually populate the data onto the page that we were just on a moment ago. So when we go back, we'll be able to see that for ourselves. I'm starting to run a little bit short on time, which is okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna Quickly show just a remainder of this, hop into gateway training for a quick moment. Uh, but it's just sort of for reference, you can see now distributions uh, have been uploaded. If we want to click on the number for June next to Harrison Township, uh, we can see the distribution amounts by funds. We can verify that there's an amount for each of the funds that we would have expected. Um, and again, we can hop back into, into the unit itself and take a look at it on a more detailed level through the Manage Distributions page. So there it is. Again, big time saver to use the upload feature as opposed to, to keying things in manually. I'd encourage you all to use it. Um, Form 22 is hopefully coming out for December distributions. Stay tuned for more details. Um, but we're really excited about this one. It, it's one that our guys have put a lot of work into um, and I think is going to serve a really nice purpose for us. Uh, so just quickly for the last minute or two that I have, I wanted to, to do a quick transition uh, and talk about gateway training. Uh, we're performing gateway training, we're providing gateway training over basically a month long process from, from early May through early June. We, we actually did one on Tuesday that uh, I think a lot of folks in the room went to uh, over at the government center. Um, we had a couple different rooms, but, but we're doing them across the state. We, we have uh, 40 training sessions, or in, in the ballpark of 40 training sessions. And at the time I, I had submitted this deck, we had 600 people registered, and, and now we're over 700 people. We're receiving a lot of really good feedback from, from new officials in particular um, that, that are finding it useful. Some of the folks that have been around, been around Gateway before, um, they're, they're either using it as a refresher or, or you know, for some of them it, it may be some of the same information they've seen before. Um, there's not a ton of changes to the budget application this year, which I'm sure will be a relief to most folks. Just a few minor tweaks here and there. Uh, but if you haven't been to Gateway training, um, we still do have these available around the state over the next couple weeks. You can contact me or you can contact our gateway address to get signed up. Um, and I really encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, 
So that's all that I have for the day. Uh, my contact information is here uh, on, on this slide. Um, again, you're welcome to call or email anytime. I, I do my best to, to make myself available as much as possible. Um, and agency-wide, we do our best to do the same thing. Um, so again, just as I wrap up, I want to say uh, thank you again for all the hard work that you all have put in um, as it relates to Gateway in particular, all the feedback that you continue to provide to us, software certification. Um, we appreciate everything that everyone in the room has been doing. I'll be out there at the, the LGF table for the rest of the day, and I look forward to catching up with many of you there. So thank you all. <laughs>